This lecture is about the Directory, who spanned the years 1795 to 1799 during the French Revolution. If you've not already seen my video on the Thermidorian reaction and the period leading up to the rule of the Directory, then I really suggest that you watch that before you continue with this video. So, the Directory. Historians have traditionally regarded the Directory as a failure, tolerated rather than supported destroyed by inward corruption and lacking a clear vision for the future. However, this view can certainly be challenged, and it's my intention over the course of this lecture to really try to challenge that interpretation, but also to try to provide that traditional interpretation and evidence that meets it. The directory represented an attempt to return to the moderate revolution before government was radicalised by the terror and to deal with enemies to both the left and the right that tried to challenge this. What is seen as corruption could be interpreted as the desperate attempt of the middle ground to forestall extremism at a time when political processes were underdeveloped and mobs were pure, purely poorly educated and easily influenced. The directory certainly commanded a core of bourgeois support and some of its measures, particularly in the economic sphere, can actually be seen as quite forward-looking. Furthermore, the directory presided over years of success in war, at least in some theatres, and the ability to maintain that war effort should be taken into account in a full evaluation of the regime. I just want to share with you uh, the manifesto of the directors, which was put forward to the French people on the 5th of November 1795, at the beginning of our timeline here. And this was really an attempt for the directory to set out its agenda, to set out what it politically stood for, and an attempt to really propagandise this new constitution. Obviously, France had seen a few by this point. Frenchmen, the executive directory has just been installed. Resolve, resolve to maintain liberty or to perish. It is determined to consolidate the republic and to give all dispatch and vigour to the constitution. Inflexible justice and the strictest observance of laws will be its rule. To wage an active war on royalism, to revive patriotism, to repress all factions vigorously, to annihilate every desire for vengeance, to restore peace, to regenerate morals, to revive commerce and industry, to revivify the arts and sciences, to establish plenty and the public credit, to reinstate social order in place of chaos, which is inseparable from revolution. Finally, to obtain for the French Republic the happiness and glory which awaits Frenchmen. Support with wisdom the ever active efforts of the executive directory towards the prompt establishment of public happiness, and soon, with the glorious title of Republicans, you will irrevocably assure national peace and prosperity. So, the new constitution that created the directory of November 1795 had been drawn up by the Thermidorians in August 1795 and ratified by a referendum by September. It reflected a desire for stability and moderation after years of political turbulence and radicalism. So what you'll see here from my diagram is the way in which the directory and the constitution was founded, established and set up. So at the very top we have the executive, which consisted of five directors who were appointed by the legislature. The legislature was split into two bodies not too dissimilar to our system in the United Kingdom, our bicameral legislature, which uh, contains the House of Commons and the House of Lords. Um, in the directory system under the Constitution of Year 5, the lower house, the House of Representatives, was the 500, which, funnily enough, consisted of 500 members. Their job was to propose legislation, but they weren't allowed to vote on it. And they were all aged um, of 30 and over. So no one under the age of 30 was allowed to serve in the Council of 500. The upper house was made up of the Council of Ancients, or the Chamber of the Ancients, uh, which itself consisted of 250 members, and they would vote on the laws proposed by the lower house. All members of the upper house, the Ancien, the Ancients, were over the age of 40. And this was really deliberate, um, and possibly something for you to reflect on, but the kind of received wisdom was the fact that the older you are, the more moderate uh, your political beliefs could be, uh, the more uh, conservative you possibly are, as you tend to own more property, have a greater stake in society. So that was certainly the received wisdom and thinking of this constitution, that obviously if we get rid of the young firebrands that so dominated uh, the, the period of the Jacobins, if you think of Saint-Just, for example, this 
really, really extreme Jacobin who was in his in his early twenties. We're not going to see deputies of that ilk again. We're going to see more moderate, older individuals. Two thirds of the legislature would initially be filled by members of the convention in order to ensure that there was a little bit of uh, transfer between these two political regimes. And of course, that was probably done really to, to stifle any opposition and to ensure that the political elite of France kind of contained, uh, remained power and, and continued to uh, exercise that power so as to stop rebellion and opposition. The qualifications for voting under the directory were some of the more severe of the French Revolution, and by that I mean the property qualification was at its highest. So the vast majority of those enfranchised in France during this period were wealthy, middle-class property owners. And this is a real, real juxtaposition to the Constitution of 1793, the Constitution of Year One, which was never really implemented owing to the terror, which obviously legislated for a um, universal male suffrage, assuming that you were over the age of 21. Um, so this is very different. This is, I guess you could say, much less liberal, much more restrained, much more moderate was the hope. Um, obviously, only enfranchising those with property would have less radical, less extreme beliefs. Um, the constitution of year three also stated that the voters, the voting classes, had to own a lot of property. So this wasn't even like the constitution of 1791, the first constitution of the French Revolution, where property owners, uh, the, the, the only equivalent of up to three days wages, were allowed to vote actually you had to own anywhere in the region of 150 to 200 days wages, which broadly uh, enfranchised about 40,000 Frenchmen. So very limited voting qualification here. And this slide just really sums up the two roles of the legislative and the executive. And I'm just going to expand on this um, just for a moment. So the way that this is designed is to deliberately stop power from concentrating in the hands of any individual or any individual committee. Obviously, the um, centralization of power under the Jacobins was completely anathema to this new regime. So the idea was for the directory to exercise power in a very decentralized way. The Council of 500, obviously their job is to propose legislation. The Council of Ancients, they vote on the legislation. There's to be very little communication between these two bodies. Obviously this has an alternative effect, which is also to really slow down legislation, to really grind to a halt uh, political change and developments. Now, in a way that was seen as very positive after a time of complete upheaval and political tumult, but in many ways, this could also be a problem going forward, particularly in times of emergencies. Governments need to act swiftly and efficiently. And this legislative system, this mechanism under the Constitution of Year 3, certainly didn't allow that to happen. The executive itself, the directory of five men, was actually quite limited in its power. All directors would hold office nominally for five years, no longer, but one was chosen at random and they would have to retire each year. And again, the thinking behind this is to try to stop the probability or at least limit the probability of one individual from gaining too much undue influence or power. In terms of the actual powers of the directory themselves, they could not initiate legislation. They couldn't come up with bills or law and they weren't allowed to veto laws either. So any bills which had become laws by going through the 500 and the ancients could not then be retracted by the executive. But they did have some areas of considerable authority. For example, they were in charge of all foreign di diplomacy, they were in charge of military affairs, they were in charge of the situation of war, and they were in charge of law enforcement. They also, of course, exerted a lot of soft power over the councils. They were able to influence the workings of these politicians and of course they will use that hugely to their effect as time goes on and as the directory starts to fall into this more despotic, more corrupt institution which it's known as being today. Good intentions to begin with but real problems going forward. So in the course of its four-year life 13 men served as directors but 
I'm just going to talk about four individuals, not all 13, just four individuals today. The first individual that I'd like to mention is Lazare Carnot. You will probably recall Carnot from one of the previous lectures, um, particularly um, from the period 1793 to 1794. Lazare Carnot actually served as a leading member of the Committee of Public Safety, but he was not part of Robespierre's faction within this committee. He was actually quite conservative. Um, he was a Republican, but a conservative Republican, I think it's fair to say. He wasn't a Jacobin. He was the architect of the Levé en masse, the first, the world's first conscription order, and was widely seen by the French public and political establishment and elite as a military expert. He will go on to obviously become quite a formidable political figure within the directorial period. The second figure that I want to mention is Emmanuel Joseph Sailly, otherwise known as the Abbé Sailly. So Sailly was um, an early hero of the revolution. And if you can cast your minds back to the early revolution, 1789, 1788 even, with the Assembly of Notables and the political crisis, which reached its peak with the Estates General and the issue of voting by order and by head. So he really cut his teeth in that political atmosphere. His pamphlet, the very influential and instrumental What is the Third Estate, is widely seen by historians as having politicised the masses during the Estates General voting crisis. He didn't actually serve as a director to 17, until 1799, until the very end of this period. But he would actually be the director that, 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 that kind of actually brings down this period. He actually sees Napoleon's seizure of power. He enables him within the coup of Brumaya, which will be the subject of the next lecture. The next director was Roger de Coeur. De Coeur was a very well-known moderate. He'd, for want of a better word, kept his head down during the years of the terror. He wasn't too radical. The reason why I mention him is he goes on to become a founder member of Napoleon's consulate, which will go on to replace the directory. And by all accounts, the most uh, electric figure of this period was Paul Barrar. Paul Barrar was a wily and venal politician, and he's the man generally credited with the introduction of Napoleon Bonaparte to public life. He was the only director, director to actually serve for the entire period, 1795 all the way through to 1799, which was a bit of a statistical improbability, considering they were chosen by a lot and they had to retire. One had to retire once a year. Either Paul Barrar got very lucky when the lots were pulled, or perhaps, more believably, his influence and corruption forestalled his um, departure from the directory. Paul Barrar is a politician that I quite like to compare to Danton during the period of the terror. Like Danton, he was known for his indulgence. He was alleged to have had dozens of mistresses, including Napoleon's future wife, Josephine. He actually introduced Napoleon to Josephine, which was quite odd. Uh, he also had a slew of male lovers. Uh, he solicited male prostitutes in Paris throughout the period. While the corruption of his administration was extraordinary even for France, Barras's alleged immorality in public and private life is often cited as a major contribution to the fall of the directory and the creation of the consulate. So a very electric figure, a very lively figure, a very uh, colourful figure. However, the, since the directory sought, at least from the beginning, to limit the power of individual politicians, no prominent leader actually stood out. This left the directory, ironically, without clear direction, and the directors, who had a variety of differing political views, found it very difficult to work together. After its first year, the difference of views held by directors led to a schism between the more moderate conservatives in the directory, like Lazare Carnot, on the one side, and Republicans like Paul Barrar, and two other directors that we've not mentioned yet, two of the 13 that serve as directors over the period, Rubel and Rebellia Le Pope. So there is a clear political ideological division within the directory itself. Another problem was that there was no mechanism to effectively resolve disputes between the executive directors and their legislative councils. So no real mechanism to override the Council of 500 or the Council of Ancients, and likewise, no real mechanism for those two councils to put the brakes on the directory either. This only really became acute by 1799, but it is one of the reasons why the directors resorted to underhand 
and unconstitutional practices to try to control the composition of the councils particularly and that's an issue that we'll go on to look at. So what I now want to turn to is really one of the, the largest issues facing the directory. And this is something that I want you to consider as we go through this lecture. And it's something that we'll return to at the very end of the lecture too. So the Thermidorians wanted to get rid of price controls. And so in December 1794, they were abolished. The Thermidorians, as you'll remember from last le lesson, were largely physiocratic and economic belief. They believed in free trade. They didn't believe in government intervention, and that made them very different to the Jacobins who went before them. Unfortunately for the Thermidorians and the Directory, which would go on to inherit that decision, the ab abolition of price controls leads to a huge drop in the value of the assignat, the paper currency that has been floating around in France since 1790. And as a result, the drop in the value of the assignat, there was huge inflation across France. Um, meaning that the cost of bread went up astronomically, but also the cost of goods. The directory had also inherited a really badly unbalanced budget. And of course, that unbalanced budget, the fact that they were spending more than they were receiving in tax receipts, was only exacerbated by the rising costs of war, which in turn was particularly affected by the British blockade, which hasn't really relented since 1793 and has stopped the free flow of French trade from the colonies from places like Saint-Domingue, uh, what we today call Haiti, um, to France. The situation, this economic and financial situation, was made even worse by a poor harvest in 1794, a particularly brutal winter, which led to grain shortages. Rivers actually froze, as did canals, and factories closed down as a result of the fact that goods weren't able to flow from cities to rural areas, and likewise from rural areas to cities. To compound all of these issues, the fact that the assignat was now worthless, the fact that there was massive inflation too, meant that the producers of grain and crops were very, very, very reluctant to actually let go of their grain. Instead, they began to hoard their produce, which actually led to starvation in the cities. The great rural landowners refused to actually sell their grain to the government and to large distributors. And this leads to uh, fierce starvation in the city. Rouart, who is a publisher at the time, describes the, the situation thus. The, plan, the flower intended for Paris is stopped on the way and stolen by citizens, even hungrier, no doubt, than ourselves. Yet there is no lack of corn anywhere. And I think this is a really interesting um, reflection of the breakdown in law and order which accompanied this economic disaster. What you need to think about is that economic is, economics um, in history we often almost treat in a vacuum, but you need to understand the interrelationship between economic issues, political issues and social issues in order to really understand historical developments and changes. And I think this gives us a really, really good uh, indication of how law and order in the provinces was breaking down as a result of this economic crisis. And here we have a very useful graph showing the drop in the relative value of the assignat. As you can see here, by 1794, by the period of the Thermidorian reaction in the directory, the value of the assignat has really just dropped off off the edge. And by May 1795, the assignat is actually worth 4% of its face value. So it is effectively worthless. We'll return back to this at the end of the lecture when we try to see what the directory do to solve these problems. But at the moment, I'm just trying to paint this picture of the issues facing the directory. The next series of issues that I really want to discuss are the political crises facing France, and particularly facing the Directory during this period. It's important to understand that both Royalism and Jacobinism remained potent forces within France, and of course outside of France too. And both of these forces, both of these ideologies, on the right with Royalism and on the left with Jacobinism, were challenges to the Directory's bid for moderate, centrist, democratic, quote-unquote, government. Okay? The rising of Vendémiaire, which we spoke about in the last lecture, had occurred in October 1795, 
a few days before the new constitution came into being and showed the extent to which royalism had grown since the terror. But I actually think it's really important to understand that Vendemiaire wasn't just a royalist revolt. It was also a revolt taken by the people of Paris who were in the midst of this economic crisis. They actually join in league with the royalists. So I think this general expression of animosity, of of kind of unfavorability towards the government really indicates the situation that this new government is inheriting. Then the directory had only been able to establish itself thanks to the prompt action of the army in crushing the revolt. You'll know Napoleon's famous whiff of grape shot in putting down the rebels in Paris, literally opening fire on fellow Frenchmen, murdering scores, leagues of French civilians. These political crises only increase over the period. They don't go away. And even though the Thermidorians had some initial successes in dismantling the terror, in curving the, the grip, the vice -like grip that the Jacobins had on French government, they aren't completely successful. The Jacobin Club, for example, is banned in 1794, as we discussed last lesson, but it does continue to operate underground. And we're starting to see a wave of neo-Jacobinism, new Jacobinism emerging in France. The first political threat that I really want to talk about is the threat from abroad. And this threat largely exists in the form of the rather corporeal Louis XVIII, the Comte de Provence. Louis XVIII is actually the late king, Louis Capet, Louis XVI's eldest younger brother. Louis' son, Louis XVI's son, the late beheaded Louis XVI, his son and direct heir had actually died in 1795 at the age of 10. Louis XVII, he never becomes monarch. Louis XVIII, interestingly, will go on to become king of France at the end of our period, 1815, um, and actually very briefly in 1814 too. So during this period, Louis XVIII is living abroad as an homme gray. Um, he has fled France in the early years of the revolution, and of course he's using his considerable influence at foreign courts to try to push for a counter-revolutionary resurgence against France, the kind that we saw in 1792 and 1793 within the Vendée. He's hoping that the homme gray landowners, those who had fled France, throughout this revolutionary period, will take up arms against the revolution, will charge in again. So he issues something called the Declaration of Verona. To most historians, this is actually seen as a bit of a farce. What he issued here was a, a command, a direct order to the nobility um, outside of France and also to the people inside of France, basically announcing his intention to restore the Ancien Regime and to punish the revolutionaries who had stripped apart the country since 1789. This is a very misadvised, misadvised intervention. And that is because, of course, a lot of the change, not all of it, but a lot of the change, which has occurred in the early revolutionary period, is, of course, very welcomed by the people of France. Not least, of course, the abolition of seigneurial titles, the freedom of the press, the fairness and equality that has been brought into the legal system, albeit with some minor blips during the terror, of course. Um, some of these things are, you know, you can't turn the back you, you can't turn the time back. You can't stop the floodgates with some of these reforms. They are genuinely liberal. They have enfranchised people. They have brought them into contact with their state for the first time. Okay, The French don't love the constitution of year three, but restoration of the monarchy, along with all of the old feudal privileges that come along with it and the Ancien Regime, really means the return of privileged nobility, the re-implementation of the manorial system, the re-implementation of serfdom, the, the, the kind of turning the clock back to the old, unfair, deeply unequal taxation system. So what I would argue is that Louis XVIII really misjudges his audience when he releases this to the French public from abroad. Many people just don't buy it. People don't want to see a return to the monarchy in the way that he's bringing it about, in the way that he's intending it. So in many areas, uh, the Declaration of Verona falls on deaf ears. And I think nobody sums this up better than the famous French politician Talleyrand, who will go on to become a bit of a rascal, uh, certainly under Napoleon. Talleyrand sums up the situation thus. 
Orban's learnt nothing and forgot nothing. This kind of lack of political awareness and astuteness will bite Louis XVIII when he realises that this counter-revolution that he's calling for never really takes off. The Directory also face a host of enemies on the left as well as on the right. And the first such enemy that I want to discuss is the Babouf plot, otherwise known as the Conspiracy of Equals. So this plot was very much orchestrated by a radical pamphleteer of the name Gracchus Babouf. And Babouf was actually in many respects quite similar to Marat. His politics were actually probably further to the left of the Jacobins. He's probably more of an old Cordelia, if you were to hammer his colours to the mass. Um, he was the editor of the increasingly popular Tribune de Peuple, uh, the Voice of the People magazine, which was gaining a steady followership and readership in Paris. Babouf disliked the constitution of year three because he believed that it was merely a bourgeois revolution in disguise. And actually, was he wrong? I'm not sure he was. Anyway, Babouf went on to initiate something which he called the Conspiracy of Equals, which sought to galvanise a popular uprising to, in his words, establish the communal management of property and abolish private possession. In this way, many historians have actually seen Gracchus Babouf as the first communist, as a proto-communist, you know, 60, 70 years before Karl Marx's uh, Capital and Friedrich Engels' work on, on the same ideology too. It was the attempts of the Directory to deal with the economic crisis that gave Babouf his historical importance and platform. The new government was pledged to abolish the system by which Paris was fed at the expense of all France, and the cessation of the distribution of bread and meat at nominal prices was fixed for the 20th of February 1796. So this goes back to the destruction, the abolition of the uh, the fixed price is the general maximum which had gained so much favour under the Jacobins. This announcement caused the most widespread consternation. Not only were the workmen and large class of proletarians attracted to Paris by the system, but rentier and government officials whose incomes were paid in assignat on a scale arbitrarily fixed by the government saw themselves threatened with starvation. The government yielded to the outcry, but the expedients by which it sought to mitigate the evil, notably the division of those entitled to relief into classes, only increased the alarm and discontent. The universal misery gave point to virulent attacks by Babouf on the existing order and gained him a hearing. He gathered around him a small circle of followers known as the Society d'Agoul, soon merged with the rump of the Jacobin Club. So, and like I said at the beginning, Babouf is not really a Jacobin, but his sympathies definitely align with the hard left. And they begin to meet at the Pantheon, the famous church um, in, in Paris. Although actually deconsecrated church is probably the best way of putting it. Today, it's actually the most wonderful temple to the famous fallen in France. People like Voltaire um, are buried there and even modern French heroes like Marie Curie. In November 1795, Babouf was reported by the police to be openly preaching insurrection, revolt, and the constitution of 1793. And by that, he, of course, means a return to universal male suffrage and the end of the bourgeois constitution, as he saw it, of the directory. So Babouf, by November, by late 1795, is openly, openly advocating the violent overthrow of the government and its replacement with a republican dictatorship, which would have the power to create an equal society, a bit like the Bolshevik Revolution of 1917. For a time, the government, while keeping itself informed of his activities, actually left Babouf alone. It suited the directory to let the socialist agitation continue in order to deter the people from joining in any royalist movement. And this is how the enemies from the left and the enemies from the right kind of dovetail. You need to understand that this is going on at the same time as the Verona Declaration. And whether this is true or not, the directory saw the royalist resurgence as the more credible of the two threats to its legitimacy. And so it actually hoped that what Babouf was doing was kind of detracting attention away from Louis XVIII's call for a violent counter-revolution. So that is important to understand. 
The distress amongst all classes continued, starvation wasn't solved. Obviously, we've talked about the ongoing economic problems facing France that I started the lecture with. And in March, the attempt of the directory to replace the assignat with a new issue of mandat, the new currency, created fresh dissatisfaction after the breakdown of the hopes first raised. A cry went out that national bankruptcy had been declared and thousands of the lower class members of the Parisians, uh, Parisian um, departments and sections began to rally on Babu's flag. On the 4th of April, 1796, the government received a report that half a million people in Paris were in need of relief, which really goes to show the huge nature of the economic crisis. From the 11th of April, 1796, Paris was placarded with posters headed, Analyse the Doctrine of Babouf. So Babouf's um, Tribune de Pup, in his Tribune de Pup, The Conspiracy of Equals, is now being seen plastered all over the walls of the major buildings in Paris. The Directory thought it time to react, and so its central bureau um, accumulated through its agents um, lots of evidence of conspiracy that Babouf was plotting and actually began to outwardly denounce Babouf as a Jacobin and like all Jacobins, therefore, illegal under the Thermidorian reforms. Now, in reality, what happens is perhaps a bit of an anti-climax. The Directory, in full control of the army at this point, in full control of the police in Paris, very quickly arrest Babouf and many of his followers and sentence them to the guillotine. Um, and that's really it. That's the end of Babouf. And in this sense, you could argue that the directory is very swift and effective in dealing with this enemy on the left. But what I think this is interesting, why I think this is interesting, is it exposes some of the issues facing the urban centres in, in France, not least in Paris. It exposes the kind of nature of starvation, it exposes the willingness of the lower, more impoverished sections of these cities to side with a much more radical agenda. Interestingly, the words anarchist and communist obviously didn't exist at the time of the conspiracy, but the word communism was actually coined uh, by a figure called Goodwin Barnby, and he actually thought that this was taken from a conversation uh, with those he described as the disciples of Babouf. So some of the earliest uses of the word communist were used in relation to Babouf. And I think this uh, quote from Babouf's Manifesto of Equals, his Conspiracy of Equals, is worth dwelling on as well. This is really what he stood for. We need not only the equality of rights written into the Declaration of the Rights of Man and Citizen, we want it in our midst, under the roofs of our houses. Let it at last end, this great scandal that our descendants will never believe existed. Disappear at last, revolting distinctions between rich and poor, great and small, masters and servants, rulers and ruled. The moment has come to found the Republic of Equals, the great home open to all men. The organisation of real equality, the only one that responds to all needs without causing any victims, without costing any sacrifice, will not at first please everyone. The selfish, the ambitious, will tremble with rage. So you can see very vitriolic language, very powerful language in asserting Babu's agenda, this conspiracy of equals. And what I just want to show you here is a wonderful um, woodcut um, engraving which obviously appeared in Parisian magazines. And this was actually um, counter to Babouf. This, um, this political cartoon is sponsored by the directory. And what it's effectively showing is that Babouf is almost like this corruption, this taint, um, this infected, um, anarchistic, you know, he's covered with a snail figure trying to stab liberty in the back, trying to stab this new constitution in the back and therefore ruin um, this great new constitution. Obviously, the uh, figure of liberty is touching this um, heavenly halo and in the middle it says constitution of year three. But in the back, fortunately for the directory, there is this figure stabbing Babouf 
at least it's meant to be about both this kind of Medusa figure through the breast, through the heart. And it's obviously showing that the Republic has been saved. Um, the translation down here reads, France in the form of a nourishing young and vigorous mother. Also kind of the, the allegory of, of liberty admires the harmony of its constitution, the established authorities and the departments. The furious and jealous anarchy advised by an astute snake will plunge its daggers into the bosom of the fatherland, but the defensive genius of the Republic stops him in his fury. Not the most catchy of propaganda titles, given, but a really interesting use of language here. Note the fact that France and the Republic is portrayed as a virtuous, young, vigorous mother, um, and all of the connotations that come along with that. Um, the association, obviously, with femininity and the French Revolution is something that we have mentioned before and something that we have spoken about. But the fact that it is also um, shown in this maternal lens, it's a mother, I think is also very, very telling and important. Let's return to enemies on the right. And this is the first of three major political crises and elections which upset the delicate balance um, attempted to be achieved by the directory. So the first of these crises was a crisis from the political right, the Royalists, uh, which occurred on the 18th of Fructidor, 1797. And this um, obviously uses the French calendar, the French revolutionary calendar. To us, 18 Fructidor translates to 4th of September, 1797. So effectively, what Fructidor was, was a seizure of power by members of the French directory, so by the own government, whilst their opponents, the royalists, were gaining in strength. And I just want to reflect on what Howard G. Brown, professor of history at Binghamton University, has to say about Fructidor. He actually says that this is the moment that um, showed the directory um, in, a, in a more despotic light. This is the moment where they show their true colours, where they reveal their true intentions as almost fairly despotic and dictatorial um, entities and organisations. Um, he blames the directory for having shown chronic violence, ambivalent forms of justice and repeated recourse to heavy handed repression. And Fructidor is the first real, I guess, example of that, at least since Vendemia. I guess you could include the Babouf plot with that too. So what happened? Royalist candidates in the elections of 1797 gain 87 seats, where a third of the seats in the 500 were at stake. So they win a majority in this election. They were poised to later win the next round of elections too, which would have enabled them probably to have assumed control of the directory. Because you'll remember that the five directors, um, when they retire one a year, drawn by lot, they are replaced. And they are replaced by a nomination that comes from these councils. Now, if these councils are dominated by royalists, you can bet your bottom dollar that the next director will be a royalist. The wealthy, populous northern departments of France return the largest proportion of monarchists. Now, this in its own right is interesting because these northern departments aren't actually royalist in tone. They're actually fairly industrialised. They're actually the home of fairly middle class people, not people that we would necessarily expect to have sympathies with royalism, not people that had ties really to the aristocratic regime before the revolution. So what does this suggest? Well, to me, it suggests that the directory was actually losing the support of the richer bourgeoisie, the men that the government was specifically designed around. We're going to return to this later, but there's a reason for that loss of support amongst their core support base, and that is to do with their economic policy, but we'll turn to that later. One of the royalists elected um, during these elections, Pichigru, actually goes on to become the president of the 500. These councils also have presidents. They're not directors, but they, are, they oversee the work of those two um, houses, those two chambers. So Pichigru becomes president of the 500. At the same time, there were two directors in place at the time that had monarchist sympathies. Barthélemy and even Carno, who we have mentioned before, was known to be developing conservative tendencies. Despite this, the core of the directory and the core of the Ancien 500 was relatively moderate towards a Republican. So what happened then? 
was that the Republicans worked a coup d'etat to maintain the status quo. In fact, what actually happens is Napoleon Bonaparte, this rising star in the French military, who the next lecture will be devoted to, his early years at least, senses an opportunity to advance in the esteem, his esteem in the eyes of the directory. What he does is he supplies documentation to the directory, to the moderate directors at least, of Pichigrou. And he suggests in this documentation that Pichigrou is plotting a counter-revolution, that he's suspect of treasonous activity. Using this documentation as their legitimate um, legitimacy, using it as their way of actually um, conducting this coup, Napoleon is ordered by the directory to send General Augereau, one of his subordinates, to Paris to support the directory. And thus begins the coup d'etat of Fratador. At dawn on the 4th of September 1797, Paris was declared to be under martial law. Augereau's forces arrive in the city. They provide the much-needed weaponry and ballast to the government. While a decree was issued asserting that anyone supporting royalism or the restoration of the Constitution of 1793 was to be shot without trial. The Directory used this as a way to arrest Connor and Barthélemy, two of the royalist directors, or at least the conservative directors, and they also go on to arrest 53 royalists within the 500, including Pichigrou, the president of the 500. These individuals who are arrested are later exiled to the city of Cayenne, uh, which is in French Guiana and known as the Dry Guillotine. Um, a fate worse than death, really, and obviously would end in death. Directory actually responded to all of this as well by annulling the 1797 elections and they actually make appointments to the two councils themselves rather than opening up a second election. So what you can see here is the Directory are effectively behaving as a dictatorship. They have completely annulled these elections, they've arrested the royalists that have been elected, including the president of the 500, and they haven't held a second series of elections. Instead, they've packed the 500 with men that they know will be loyal to them. The important thing about this coup, as we've already mentioned, as Howard G. Brown states, is that this coup signals the end of parliamentary government and of the constitution of year three effectively. The directory now could effectively be ruled by executive decision rather than paying attention to the legislative. But the one thing that I would really stress here is that it was the power of the army, it was the president, the presence of Augereau in Paris that enabled the directory to do this. The second political crisis that I just want to quickly discuss in a lot less detail to the last one is the law of 22 Floreal, which actually occurs the next year. This time it actually concerns those on the left, not those on the right. So what the law of 22 Flor Floreal was, was effectively another bloodless coup. Nobody died in this, but the directory assert their dominance over a new set of elections. So what effectively happens is it's the same basic premise as Fructidor, only this time it is the Republicans who are voted into the 500 during the elections of 1798. There are elections held this year too. To redress the, abal the balance and protect the moderate basis of the directory, 106 of the new deputies elected were actually deprived of office immediately and the elections, just like the year before, yet again were annulled. There was little justification for this insider coup as no one could pretend that the directory was in any danger. Ultimately, this served to underscore the fact that the directory had shown contempt for the wishes of the electors. So effectively, we've got another set of elections. This time they return a, a score of deputies on the left, and the directory yet again completely hold the democratic process in contempt. They do not allow these new members of the Council of 500 to even take their seats. Um, many of them were deprived of office immediately. And just to underscore how far this coup goes as well, uh, this figure that we see here, Jean-Baptiste Treyard, Treyard um, was a director uh, just before this coup. Um, he is actually brought in 
uh, during the coup to replace a director called Neufchâteau. And that is because Neufchâteau is seen to be um, Jacobin in sympathy. So again, we're not only seeing purges of the councils, we're seeing purges of the directory itself by a core within the directory, all of whom are centred around Paul Barrat, who's kind of pulling the strings by this point. So the final political crisis, and this occurs the year after, so we've got a political crisis in 1797, political crisis in 1798, and the final political crisis of 1799. I've actually labelled this enemies on the inside rather than enemies on the left and right. And this is probably the most significant of all of the coups. Um, obviously, the coup of Fructidor is significant because it kind of symbolised the beginning of this rule of tyranny by the Directory. But the coup of Prairial really sets up the demise of the Directory. So the coup of 30 Prairial, also known as the Revenge of the Councils, was a bloodless coup in France that occurred on the 18th of June, 1799. It left Emmanuel Joseph Saïd, as the dominant figure of the French government and prefigured the coup of 18 Brumaire that brought Napoleon Bonaparte to power. And we'll turn to that coup next lecture. The March to April 1799 elections, this time of 315 new deputies. Remember, if you remember from last lecture, not all the deputies are elected at once. They're elected in tranches. Um, the elections this time of the 315 new deputies had produced a new neo-Jacobin majority in these two bodies. So much like the, the elections the year before. The Council of 500 became unhappy with the director's conduct in the War of the Second Coalition, particularly the German campaign. Um, the Council of Ancients and the 500 uh, voted an act declaring that the election of Jean-Baptiste Treard, who we saw in the last slide, had been illegal. And on the 29th of Prairial, they replace him with Louis Goyer, erstwhile Jacobin deputy and minister during the convention. So the, this new director who's brought in to replace Treyard, and I understand that this is quite confusing because they're getting replaced left, right and centre, but that just shows you how unstable this period is. This new director actually has Jacobin sympathies. Sayi, who had recently been chosen by the ballot, to replace the retiring Rubel as director, decided to take advantage of this growing animosity between directors and councils. Together with Paul Barrat, he proposed to enforce the council's demands that two fellow directors, Lepo and Dedois, should stand down. On the 18th of June, when these directors resisted, Sayi called on General Gilbert, who had taken command of the army in Paris to organise troop movements in the capital to threaten the directors. The same evening, their resignations were received and Sayi emerged triumphant. For the first time, the councils had forced a purge of the directors and not the other way around. But Sayi had obviously capitalised on this crisis to put himself as the preeminent director. So at this point, he has pretty much seized power. Barra is also kind of along for the ride here too. Rather than healing divisions, the directory seemed to have increased them. It had constantly overturned electoral results and had grown increasingly dependent on the army to maintain itself. In July 1799, fearful of the growing Jacobin sentiment in the councils, it was Saiz's turn to turn on them, introducing the law of hostages, which gave local authorities the power to take action against potential radicals. This signified a final rift between the executive and the legislature. Following this, there was little to hold the government together, and after the Prairial coup, it was only a matter of months before the final coup of Brumaire in November 1799, which actually brought the destruction of the directory entirely. So coup of Prorail, absolutely, absolutely significant in setting the stage for the ultimate destruction of the directory, tearing apart this fragile alliance of councils and directors. Not only does the directory face opposition on the left, and the right, and even amongst itself, it starts to face 
emerging opposition within the army, this body that has been so reliant upon to uphold its own survival. The army has been completely existentially important to the Directory. Without the army, the Directory would have failed at the first hurdle. And the important thing to understand here is that the army is growing ever more despondent and ever more against the government. Barat, who we have mentioned, actually introduced Napoleon to his position. And we're going to talk a lot more about Napoleon in the next lecture. So in a way, ironically, one of the most successful directors probably played the greatest role in bringing it down because it's this man, Napoleon, who would go on to galvanise this growing despondency within the army and use it and weaponise it against the directory. So the emergence of Napoleon as one of the ablest and most popular generals of the directory is a key feature of this period. And like I said, we will talk about that next lecture. His use by the directory to resolve political disputes made him aware of how weak the system was and how reliant upon him and individuals like him that the, uh, the directory was. By 1797, the defender of the directory had defeated the Austrians, won control of most of Italy, and even engineered single-handedly the peace of Campo Formio, which ultimately ended the first coalition unilaterally and without even consulting the directory. It's safe to say that much of the uh, much of La Gloire, which was um, accredited to the directory, much success in foreign policy was really because of Napoleon's skill and leadership. The directory obviously began to fear Napoleon, especially by 1798, especially after the Egyptian campaign, but they were also in desperate need of his spoils of war. Thus, they responded by sending him as far away as possible. They actually sent him to Egypt on what they hoped would effectively be a suicide mission for him. Again, we'll mention that and talk about that in a lot more detail next lesson. One of the final things that we need to turn to is the failure of the directory itself, some of its initiatives, some of its laws, some of the things it passes, not just the opposition that it faces, but its own attempts to legislate which fail. The first abortive piece of legislation passed by the directory that I think is significant to discuss is Jordan's Law, which is passed in 1798. By 1798, the size of the French army was beginning to shrink. Desertion, low morale, and a reluctance to join the military took its toll. Jordan's law proposed that the levée en masse be reintroduced with harsh punishments for those that didn't accept conscription. Widespread resistance to the directory throughout France occurred as a result, especially in the newly annexed Austrian Netherlands, which we today call Belgium, confusingly, where it took two months to subdue an uprising against Jordan's law. Of the first draft of conscripts meant to be raised by Jordan's law, they were aiming to raise 230,000, only 74,000 reached the army. So this conscription order completely fails. The second initiative that's worth mentioning is the force loan of 1798, same year. As its armies were being forced back into France, the Republic could no longer pay for the war by seizing foreign assets. They had already exhausted the money that Bonaparte, for example, had gathered by seizing Milan during the Italian campaign. Again, as I've mentioned before, something we'll turn to. A forced loan on the rich was decreed that was intended to raise 100 million livres. By November, though, not even a tenth of that figure had been collected. The whole point of the force loan was effectively a patriotic fundraising campaign. We'd actually seen a similar such fundraising campaign eight years before in the very early days of the revolution. The National Assembly call out to the people of France to help solve the bankruptcy by putting their faith in this new revolutionary government, by digging into their pockets and donating. And actually that was received to relative success, particularly given the economic circumstances of the early revolution. This, however, falls completely flat. What I would argue about the force loan and Jordan's law is both of these things emphasise the inability of the directory to enforce policy. The important thing as well though about the force loan, because it was forced, or at least they tried to force it, 
they actually put off a lot of people, particularly their own supporters, the wealthy bourgeoisie. They basically saw this as yet another tax, as yet another demand by their so-called bourgeois government who are supposed to be on their side. So in reality, this false line has the has the effect of actually stripping the directory of some of their most ardent early supporters. The final initiative of 1798 was the law of hostages, which itself was actually a response to the failure of Jordan's law and the false loan. So under the law of hostages, any area which refused, or any region which refused to implement the forced conscription order or the forced loan could be declared disturbed by the central government. In essence, this meant that the local authorities then had the power to arrest anybody in the region who didn't conform to these demands by central government. Such measures actually seem to be a return to the arbitrary arrests and harassment of the centralised government of the terror and was, of course, fiercely unpopular. But I actually think it's more farcical than intimidating because actually what you start to see is kind of mayors of local towns and, and key officials in local areas. They actually ignore this. They refuse to implement it knowing that this would make them very unpopular. So they actively conspire against their own central government, which is why I think this is quite farcical. Some other features of the period, some other things facing the directory, include a surge in brigandage. Brigandage just means effectively gang violence, organised crime, vagrancy as well, lawlessness, particularly in the provinces. So as a result of the fact that there was a virtual collapse of government in administration by 1799, you've already seen the failure of Jordan's law, the forced loan and the law of hostages, and because of the tiny number of troops that were available on French soil that weren't committed elsewhere, um, there was an outbreak of violent brigandage across the country. These random acts of lawlessness and violence underscored the ability of the directory to keep things together and worked with the legislation seen in the before slide to actually undermine the credibility of the government. Now the people are coming out and saying this government not only hasn't it solved the economic crisis, it can't even enforce law and order. The final thing to turn to is economic and financial policy, which of course we mentioned at the start of the lecture. Now we're going to assess how effective the regime was in dealing with them. Well, in a word, it was absolutely disastrous. The hyperinflationary policy of quantitative easing, the printing of money, seen in the early days of Thermidor, refer to my last lecture if you're not sure, resulted in massive inflation, which boosted the profits of the bourgeoisie, but in, undermined the peasantry and the saint -Colot and actually led to mass starvation and economic dissatisfaction, particularly amongst the very poor. By 1796, as we saw in the graph earlier, the assignat was literally worthless. It was replaced by a new currency, the mandat territorio, but this was also scrapped after a year. All that was left was metal coins, and these were in short supply, leading to massive deflation of stock as retailers tried to lower prices in order to stimulate demand amongst customers. So what does all of this amount to? The directory had managed to effectively alienate itself from the workers in the early period due to inflation, due to the uh, destruction of price controls, and it had managed to alienate the elite businessmen from 1797 onwards due to massive deflation. This is only exacerbated by the directory's financial policy. In the short to medium term, some historians give the directory a bit of a free pass on their financial policy. Yes, they say they're behaving like a dictatorship by 1797. Yes, they say the gains of war were kind of few and far between, actually, and limited to certain theatres. And yes, they say that some of the ways in which they dealt with political crises actually led to the galvanisation of more opposition. Some historians would argue that the directory's financial policy, on the other hand, at least in the short to medium term, was successful. I'm not so sure whether I agree with that, but I do think there are some successes, or at least some surprising successes 
Note that I keep emphasizing though that this is in the short to medium term. You have to remember that the directory inherit a lot of these problems. Many of these problems aren't necessarily exacerbated by them, although of course you could argue that they do create more opposition. But certainly the economic crisis is something that they do try to solve through astute financial policy. In September 1797, for example, um, the, the, um, the directory actually managed to write off two thirds of the national debt. And they do this through a one-off payment to debt holders. This payment, however, was made in bond, and this could only be redeemed by buying Bien Nationaux. So in effect, what actually happened was the directory paid off their debts by issuing a new bond. But this bond is tied to land, and that land is only valuable if there's confidence in the directory. The move was of immediate benefit to the government, however, and it reduced the debt of France from 240 million francs to 80 million francs. But the directory did not get off that easy. The bonds sold to the debt holders eventually became worthless as the value of land decreased due to the economic situation. And these bonds are only as valuable as the land that they represent. So the initial bond payments are now not worth what they once were. Within a year, for example, the value of the bond was 60% of its face value. And what's more, the government refused to buy these bonds back from the debt holders that it had initially sold them to. This is incredibly crafty, but also incredibly ballsy. Although the debt holders were extremely annoyed by this policy, it did help to stabilise French finances in the very short term. But you've got to ask yourself, at what price? The debt holders are the rich elite. These are people that can afford to buy government bonds. These are people that shoulder the burden of government expenditure. These are, hypothetically at least, the core support base of the directory. By doing this, they have managed to completely alienate their core support base. And this is what I was referring to earlier when I said that in the early period, the directory managed to annoy the workers. And in the later period, they managed to alienate the bourgeois elite, the businessmen. In the field of taxation, um, the directory does try to solve the problem, the economic shortfall as well, by introducing brand new taxes. And effectively, they, they start to tax anything that's pinned down. For example, they introduce a tax on doors, windows, movable property. Um, and you can imagine just how well this is received by the people of France. Yeah, not very well. They see this as a reintroduction of the hated octroi, the hated fixed taxes on property, the, tip, the fixed taxes on owned goods. Um, so this is very poorly received. Ultimately, the directory in the field of economics and finances, I would argue, were more reliant on the economic gains of war and the exploitation of areas captured from the first coalition than anything else. And it's really the proceeds of war that stop this government from entering complete economic collapse by 1797-1798. So finally, we'll turn to that foreign policy, that military and foreign policy, which will actually form the bulk of next lecture. It's really important to state that the major preoccupation of this government, the major preoccupation of the revolution at this point, 1795 to 1799, was the war against the coalition of Britain and Austria. This coalition posed an existential threat to the revolution. If this coalition succeeded, the revolution would be destroyed. That was the war aim of Britain and Austria. The military objective set by the convention in October 1795 was to enlarge France to what were declared its natural limits, the Pyrenees in the south, the Rhine in the east, and the Alps as well. Um, the borders of Gaul at the time of the Roman Empire is effectively what the early directory aimed to turn France back into, which of course would be a major achievement. It would add um, thousands of hectares, well, tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of hectares to French soil. And of course, all of the proceeds of the land and all of the proceeds of the towns and cities captured along the way. 
In 1795, Prussia, Spain and the Dutch Republic officially quit the War of the First Coalition and made peace with France. But Great Britain refused to accept the French annexation of Belgium, so it continued to fight. Beside Britain and Austria, the only enemies remaining for France were the Kingdom of Sardinia and several small Italian city-states and republics. Austria proposed a European Congress to settle borders, but the French Directory refused, demanding direct negotiations with Austria instead. Under British pressure, Austria agreed to continue the war against France. Lazare Carnot, the director who oversaw military affairs, planned a new campaign against Austria using three armies. Effectively, you would have General Jourdan, his army on the Rhine, the River Rhine. General Morel would attack along the Danube, another great river running through the Germanic states. And the third army would be the army of Italy under the command of the incredibly young Napoleon Bonaparte, who had risen in rank with spectacular speed due to his defence of the government from a royalist uprising, Vendemia, which we discussed last lecture. On the 14th of August, 1796, Jordan's army was completely obliterated by the Austrians at the Battle of Amburg. And again, on the 3rd of September, 1796, at the Battle of Wurzburg, and had to retreat all the way back to the Rhine. General Moreau, without the support of Jordan, was also forced to, re to retreat. So the point that I'm trying to make here is that not all of these military expeditions under the Directory were successful. And a lot of historians do try to argue that this was their greatest success, that they should be remembered for their military conquests and campaigns. What I would argue is that actually... Yes, in the sense that Napoleon's campaigns were successful. No, in the sense that other campaigns were particularly successful. Um, perhaps the most famous or infamous failure of the Directory uh, is a moment in history called the Irish Misadventure. Um, the Directory actually sought a new way to strike British interests um, to basically repay them for their fueling of the counter-revolution and for the British blockade. And... In, um, in late 1796, um, a French fleet of 44 vessels actually carrying an expeditionary force of 14,000 soldiers landed on Ireland. Hard to believe this. This is the last time or one of the last times that the British, at the time British, mainland was actually successfully or almost successfully invaded. What they hoped was that they could join forces with Irish rebels, who, if you know anything about Anglo-Irish relations, did not like the English very much and did not like the fact that the English were effectively occupying their land. They were colonial agitators from abroad. They were invaders. So what the French hoped was that by landing a French invasion force in Ireland, they could team up with Irish nationalists and help to overthrow um, British um, control of Ireland, which, of course, would hit Britain economically powerfully. Unfortunately, the fleet, well, not unfortunately for the British, but unfortunately for the French, the fleet was separated by storms off the Irish coast and being unable to land on Ireland, they actually had to return to their home port. They actually lost 2,000 men in the process and a good 12 uh, to 13 vessels, which don't come cheap. So, in some campaigns, the French were successful. In other campaigns, I would actually argue they were quite farcically bad. But it's Bonaparte's successes that are, of course, remembered in the history books, because those are the most significant. And they are the ones that will later go on to form the bedtime stories of French citizens everywhere and, you know, youngsters across France. Um, Bonaparte becomes really the first French celebrity of the 19th century. Um, and his successes were great. He captures nearly all of northern Italy for France, for example, including Milan, which at the time was perhaps the richest city in Central Europe. And this proved to be a massively valuable asset to the Directory. The capture of Milan alone gave the Directory 28 million leave in, in, in treasury and coffers, more than twice the amount raised as a result of their false loan. Um, so I think this is all really important. It's a bit of a mixed bag. There are some successes, but there are some failures too. What I've put here 
um, on this slide is a nice summary of what I think are the major factors um, which all kind of coalesce and combine to help overthrow the directory or at least bring it down in the popular estimation by 1799. By 1799, the government of the directory was politically unpopular and economic problems and war weariness had weakened its authority still further. The directors, in an attempt to maintain balance and to keep political power in the grasp of, quote, sensible and moderate individuals, had violated their own constitution on a number of occasions and had revealed themselves to be politically corrupt. Furthermore, the very successes of the directory, which were limited to the arena of foreign policy, territorial expansion, and victory in some fronts of the war served to underscore their reliance upon the army, who of course grew more and more influential. I want to give the last words on this subject to two really notable historians um, writing about the directory in the, in the whole, in the main. In 1971, the American historians Jerome Blum, Rondo Cameron and uh, Thomas Barnes wrote, quote, it was a government of self-interest rather than virtue, thus losing any claim on idealism. It never had a strong base of popular support. When elections were held, most of its candidates were defeated. By that it means obviously the moderate candidates. Historians have been quite negative on the directory's use of military force to overturn election returns that went against them. Having by this coup d'etat forfeited its claim to be a constitutional government, the directory henceforth clung to power only by such illegal acts as purges and quashed elections. And I think that is a wonderful summary of this period. The most celebrated and vivid description of French society on the directory, however, was, was written fairly soon after. Um, this was in the 1860s, so you know, half a century after the, the directory. Um, and this was uh, written by the Goncourt brothers, Edmund and Jules. Um, and they attempted in their book to basically describe life, culture, and preoccupations of Parisians under this directorial regime. This is how they describe it. Like a guest at the end of any orgy, France was weary, weary of gods, of tribunes, of heroes, of executioners, weary of struggles, of efforts, of cries, of curses, of enthusiasms, of fevers, of intoxications, of storms, of triumphs, of agonies. France was weary of revolutions, coup d'etats, constitutions, legislatures, weary of conquests, weary of being saved, weary of Belgium submissiveness, Italy conquered, of Germany, when all the eagles of Germany had been taken to the envelide, but France was still not the head. France was weary of climbing into the sky, of amassing empires, of monopolising the world, France glutted with glory, France broken, sleeping on a mattress of corpses, sleeping on a bed of laurels, France emptied of men, of silver, of crimes, of ideas, of eloquence. France, like Mirabeau when he was dying, asking of his doctors and his descendants only one single thing, to sleep. And I think that quote really beautifully summarises the popular mood in France by 1799. And I often have students ask me the question, how did Napoleon get away with it? How did he get away with a violent, illegal coup d'etat, which overthrew a constitutional government? That is how I would answer that question. France was tired. It wanted sleep.